guys. I just need it since you got the right ear bite. Oh, why? But I've never uh, had anybody else do the taping. <laughs> <laughs> so I like it down there, all right? You want to take that for you? What? Just for your free. No, that's all right. I'll just make up for it here. It's here or something. Uh, I'll take my uh, okay. out. Is that side of the microphone? Down? <laughs> it should get it. Should take right. it. Well, if yours does, if mine misses, yours will get it. Well, this is uh, we we don't have really all that much to ask you. I mean, or for news so far as news breaks are concerned, but we just we just have one small favor to ask. Yeah. That is, are you running? <laughs> just one small little. That's it. <laughs> That's one we can't answer yet. Uh, no. can't answer yet. No. What about the fact that Paul Laxall is going to take the chairmanship or basically take over the RNC? And a lot of people feel that he would never have taken it unless he, at least you had given him a hint well, that he might uh, uh, run. He, uh, uh, he's got his own opinions of what I'm going to do. <laughs> and uh, the only thing is, I just feel uh, there's, there are any number of reasons. If uh, if I was going to run, uh, this would be too early because it would uh, automatically then make everything I did be tagged and investigated as to whether it was for political purposes. If I were not going to run, uh, the same thing it would be too early because I would have automatically taken myself, put myself into a real lame duck situation. And so uh, I just don't think it's the time to do it or to even think about it with what we have doing. And as I've said so often, uh, before the time comes when you're going to have to make a statement about that, I think the people kind of let you know whether, whether you should or not. Will you make it soon? Will you have any chance of making it <laughs> soon? Can you give us a time limit at all? Uh, no, I know there is a time out there. When, but I think, again, that you, uh, I'll be aware of when that time comes. OK, we struck out on that one. Yeah. So I see what <laughs> Let me ask you, uh, and I also said we were going to do it since we, Human Events itself, has been, you know, obviously critical of some of your decisions from time to time. And, but can you just encapsulate what you think in your last two years of office that you feel have been uh, your most important accomplishments? You know, and why don't you just take domestic policy first, encapsulate that, and we'll go to foreign policy. Well, all right. Well, let me take that. I, because I think there are a number of accomplishments. But uh, one of the biggest to simply sum it all up is the very fact that today, and for the first time in about uh, virtually since the war, the Congress, one house of which is dominated by the other party, is uh, now debating not whether we should cut spending, but by how much. And we, on the other hand, on the Republican side, are not fighting a rear guard action against further growth of the welfare state and the federal government expanding and uh, in more social programs and so forth. But uh, when you look at it, we inherited a situation in which there was double digit, digit inflation for two years in a row. It had been steadily going up during the entire previous administration. It is now down to for the year 1982, only the second year there, 3.9%. And the last three months of that year, uh, it was running at 1.1% on an annualized basis. That has brought the interest rates down, which again, were up there at the highest they'd been in 100 years, or more than 100 years highest they'd been since around the Civil War uh, in this country. Uh, we have put into place in this government uh, and at those positions, uh, not, I'm not talking about cabinet members now, I'm talking about people that will be in sub-positions here, that getting experience that are solid conservatives, and any number of them, that will be here for years to come if there are conservative administrations, people they can call on in government that will be in place. Because I think one of the characteristics for many, many years since the New Deal has been the fact that the permanent structure of government was more or less uh, of a, the New Deal flavor had been put in place years ago with the Democrats and had continued on. And uh, this is a powerful force within the bureaucracy. 
I know as one socialist clergyman many years ago, who was a great note and wrote a book about it, said that uh, one person in government of their philosophy is worth a thousand on the outside. Um, but the thing economically that we have done, uh, they're very self-evident. But as I say, the second thing is, what is the nature of the debate in the Congress? It's on our grounds. Switching to the international scene, uh, we have, in these two years, have brought defense and our whole posture of defense to a standing that it didn't even have in the, uh, when we had the draft in effect. Uh, the, the level of people of an intelligence level and up is higher and greater numbers than has ever been true even in the draft army. The percentage of high school graduates is the greatest we've ever had. The re-enlistment rate is up at a figure we've never had, 68% re-enlistment. We have a waiting list out there. That's for that part. The weapon systems that uh, have already been approved and we're going forward with. And yet, with all of the drumbeat about the excessive spending for defense, we're taking a smaller percentage of the gross national product and a smaller percentage of the total budget that has been characteristic in the past under the, uh, when those people who were crabbing and complaining today were the ones in power and could have done something about it. Under Kennedy, uh, the, it was 46% of the budget. Well, our defense budget is 26.7% of that budget. We had uh, what they just wrote off as uncontrollables. These were things they said were in the budget that were by law and were uncontrollable. Therefore, they just had to keep on going up. Well, we've gotten a hold of the uncontrollables. And in the budget we've submitted for 1984, we were recommending reforms in those uncontrollables. The, the entitlement programs and it's going to have a long-lasting effect out there when we get a hold of these. Let me get back to the defense spending just a little bit on the, uh, yeah, you know, right now you have even conservative congressmen uh, are talk, asking you to cut the military. And even American Conservative Union Chairman Mickey Edwards has talked about that. And, uh, but you obviously feel it's very important to continue with this. Uh, Evans, program. yes, because this gets down to the other part of the international scene, uh, other than the domestic and the accomplishments that we've made. We were in total disarray. Uh, there was great friction with our allies in Europe. Uh, we saw the communist expansionist movement all over the world. Well, they haven't advanced a foot since we came here. And we have uh, restored the, the bonds with our European allies. And we've made great progress there. Uh, the same is true with our ally in the Pacific, Japan, and others. We've, uh, I think our whole uh, uh, setup in international relations is in very good shape compared to what it was. Uh, we aren't submitting treaties uh, uh, to the Senate, uh, the Soviet Union, that in reality uh, were detrimental to us while advantageous to them. Do you, uh, in terms of the, the, these conservatives that we're criticizing, are you bringing them in or are you, are you trying to convince them? Uh, yes, I think them? part of it just has to do with the drumbeat. Because by, this is by, all they're hearing. By whom? The drumbeat by whom? Well, it's in the press, but it's also up there on the hill in the majority party that we're, uh, uh, and part of it is the deficits. And they want to explain away the deficits. Well, in desperation, do exactly what our opponents have done down over the years, any time they felt they needed money, cut defense. And that's why we were in the shape we were in. Now I think some of our own people, hypnotized by uh, defense or by deficits, are saying, well, in desperation, cut defense spending. Well, if we eliminated all of the major weapon systems that we have uh, asked for and put into effect, it would make a very little contribution to reducing the, uh, the deficit. The biggest part of our defense budget is the pay for people and the maintenance and readiness of our forces. When we came here, 
50% of our planes on any given day couldn't fly for lack of spare parts. 50% of our ships couldn't leave port either for lack of spare parts or lack of non-commissioned officers and so forth, crew. That's all corrected. So we're, we have a readiness posture and this is what is taking the bulk of the money. I don't think they realize that. The other thing about the deficits is I've noticed that those who want to criticize, they use figures, uh, the way to, to make their point. Uh, if it's better for them to use percentages, they use percentages. If it's better for them to use, say, dollar figures instead of percentage, yes, we're faced with some bigger deficits than we've had before. But they aren't bigger as a percentage of the gross national product than we've had before. Or it's the, like... Or the budget. Huh? Or the budget. Or the budget. Now, when, um, when we, this is what we're aiming at, is that percentage to get that budget down and to get also the tax take that we were taking down to a certain level and to get the two of them together so that we're living within our means. Now, when I first presented the economic program in October in the campaign in Chicago, to show you what projections and how ridiculous they are, I had the best economic advice I could get. And I based our plan on those figures. By the time I'd won the election, those figures were out of date. Those projections were wrong. By the time I was inaugurated, they were really wrong. The inflation, the unemployment, the uh, interest of 21.5% and, and so forth. So we had to revamp the figures in our own program because the projections are wrong, and yet the law says that we have to make projections. Now, in October of 1980, it did look as if our plan could bring us close to a balanced budget by 84. We know that isn't possible. We're still aiming at that. It's going to take longer. Our goal now, and I think that the plan we've submitted to the Congress right now, we'll do it, is to start the budget deficits on a decline, we're not as concerned about the next two, the 83 and 84 deficits, as we are from there on, the out years. And our plan brings those down to where a balanced budget is within sight. Okay. You can see that as that line continues, you're going to make that. I'll get back, I'll get back to that, as well, but I want to ask one more thing about defense. Uh, do you still have confidence in Defense Secretary Casper Weinberg? And the reason I'm saying this is this. As you know, he has come under considerable criticism from those who want to cut military spending. But even more surprising is the report by columnist Joseph Kraft, and I quote here, that quote, a move is now afoot in the Senate and the White House to replace the Secretary of Defense. Uh, do you know of such a move? And Not how do you at feel all. That that such I a, don't a know. Report gets into the I don't White even House. know of any rumors that could have led to that Kraft column. Mm -hmm. No. Cap is, I am very satisfied with our entire cabinet. I think we've got one of the finest ones that this country's had in years and years. Well, to many conservatives, he, he is considered now, you know, a symbol of a strong defense posture. Yeah. Many people would feel that if there is any sort of move to get rid of him, they would no, be very sir. concerned. And uh, no, yeah. no way. And let me just tell you the things that they're ignoring up there in the hill with him. We submitted in February our projection for five years of defense spending. He, as we went on and as inflation came down faster than we thought, he found and volunteered $41 billion reduction in that plan that we'd submitted over the five years. Now, Congress has taken some more that we've had to swallow. They didn't take enough to really set us back. But now he has come forward with $55 billion more that he can meet without our lowering our, our posture. I told him the other day, I said, Cap, you're being a poor politician. You want to leave that in and then let the Congress take it out and they think they've accomplished something. But he takes it out and then they start trying to reduce the figure they wanted to reduce by on whatever he submits, no matter how small. But for Mickey and the fellows who feel this, as I say, that's why I dwell so long on de the deficits. I think they panic a little on this and they don't know, they don't realize that we do know what we're doing and we've got a plan in place, but they also don't realize the importance of this defense buildup. And this is why I'm 100% behind CAP and no one in here is gunning for it. Believe me, no one is. No, the, 
the thing is, right now in the world, we have restored a confidence in the United States that they hadn't had for several years. They now have it again. If the Congress did what some of them are talking about doing to defense, we would be right back where we were. But more than that, we would have no chance of getting the Soviet Union to a table to discuss disarmament. We've got three disarmament negotiations going right now with them, all of them aimed not at regulating the growth of armaments, but at actually reducing the amount of arms in the world. Now, I don't say that the Soviet Union is giving in, but I do say they came to the table because of our defense posture. They wouldn't have been there otherwise. Let me get back to the domestic achievements here. I know you've mentioned, I know that you've striven hard and your, government, and your administration has to check the growth of federal spending. But the truth is the budget, as well as the deficits, it seems to us anyway, keep racing upwards. Under President Carter, spending went up approximately $64 billion annually. But as we read your figures, spending is going up over $70 billion annually. Uh, Stan Evans, he argues that while the rate of spending growth has fallen from an average, from an annual average of 15% in Carter's last two years to under 11% in your first two, this ignores inflation. And he says in real spending growth, Carter's last two years, he argues, averaged 4.5%. Under yours, it will be actually 5.7% or higher. You no, know, I read that in column two, and my good friend, I found myself getting quite angry at him. Again, here we are, which are we going to use? What figures? In his last year, in 1980, the spending increase was 17%. Now remember, in all of 1981. You mean you're in Carter's Yes. Yeah. Now, in all of 1981, we're bound by a budget that's not ours. We come in three months after the fiscal year has started, almost four months, with a budget that was put in place for the previous administration. And even so, we managed to squeeze a few billion dollars out of that simply through management improvements and things that we found where we could just actually save some money. But we spent our 1981 trying to get our program passed and coming up with the budget that is in place now for night, well, it isn't in place. This, due to this Mickey Mouse budgeting system, we find that uh, we're still operating on uh, continuing resolutions, although they did pass the budget resolution. But the budget resolution, unlike in the state of California, isn't binding. So now we have to deal with them on every appropriation bill. But his was 17%, and he had said that his goal was somewhere in the neighborhood of 10% by 1984, well, it's somewhere in the neighborhood of 10%, not 11% now, or I mean it was, uh, yes, for, for 80, 83, uh, but by 1984, we will be down to 4 or 5%. And remember that that is including, very frankly, the increase in defense spending that we've added over and above what he had planned for his five-year uh, figure. Okay, well, let me just say something about, uh, about the, the projections, though. In other words, uh, uh, I should have the projections right here, which I don't, but the, uh, as I recall, uh, fiscal 82, what was it, 728 or something like that, it came in at 728. Yeah. And uh, now the next budget, you projected up to about 756 or 758, something around there. Mm -hmm. And now you're projecting, at fiscal 83, you're projecting actually an $805 billion uh, budget. And the, and the fiscal 83 year isn't even over. All right. So it might, so it yeah. might be well above this uh, yes. $70 billion. Per Let million. me also point out that with a recession, which no one had predicted, no one had projected that. No economists on the outside or the other side or us or not. And the having to, the, the, the loss of revenue from people not working, but also the benefits in order to sustain those people. And we've extended them, as you know, twice for those who've used up their benefits. This has increased spending beyond which you could count. Also, the high interest rates. The one thing that we should talk about is the the part that is played by interest on government borrowing, which is a figure that is greater than the total government budget 20 years ago. Now, he, his figure, his projection was $739 billion. Uh, and we came in at 728. 
which is $11 billion less than he had projected. But had he had to add the things that we had to do because of this recession, which he had not anticipated, yeah. nor had we, it, this would have added about $20 billion more to his 739. So our 728 is actually in comparison to his projection of what would have been about 760. All right, I'll, I'll, uh, we'll let it ride here for a minute. Okay, let me ask another point about entitlements. And the, the administration's budget and your speeches, and you've made a major point, and uh, we think it's absolutely right on target, is that uh, there's a great deal of emphasis that the entitlements are really what are driving up this uh, federal yes. spending. And for, for instance, it is acknowledged in one of these, uh, in one of your budget um, briefs, one of the budget manuals, that quote, that uh, the social contract claim, unquote, uh, uh, bites off bigger and bigger chunks of the gross national product. You even say, quote, the social contract base of the budget, which rose dramatically during 62 through uh, 1981, has proved to be not only locked in, but a rising claim on GNP. So uh, that's the premise here. But then, so I want to, here's the question. But how do you expect to put a check on this, these entitlements when the bipartisan Social Security package you're pressing for contains virtually no breaks on Social Security spending. There is a one-time six-month COLA freeze, and that's it so far as we can see. Bill Armstrong, a member of the commission which produced the package, says that higher taxes account for more than 75% of the assumed deficit in the short run and more than 91% in the long run. A major fan of yours, columnist William Buckley, considered this solution of the commission a virtual surrender to the Liberal Democrats. I'd like you to answer. That okay. And especially since, you know, Social Security, we consider it the Mount Everest of All these right. entitlements. Yes. And I'd like to recall a little history. I'd like to recall in 1981, yeah. we came forth with a plan aimed at getting control of that program. It would not have taken benefits away from those people now dependent on them and so forth, just as we've always promised we wouldn't. We supported that program very well, yes. by the way. And you saw it successfully made into a political football that threatened everything we were trying to do. I think it was the biggest single issue in the 82 campaign. It was dishonest in the way in which they did it. They charged us with things that we weren't guilty of at all. It is significant that the Manette, the Democratic National Chairman, even now, with the bipartisan agreement on this plan, has the nerve to send out to Social, Social Security recipients a fundraising letter in which he states that the Republicans are out to take Social Security away from them. Now, at this point, not a year ago, yeah, he's yeah, saying this, yeah. and ask for $500,000 in contributions to fight us on the Social Security issue. Yeah. Now, all during the campaign, I had said that I thought that, it, I, remember for about 30 years, I've been making speeches that Social Security, my speech for Goldwater in 64. I remember that very well. In there, I pointed that right then, it was $300 billion out of actuarial balance, and no one was saying anything about it or proposing doing anything about it. Yeah. So they kept on not doing anything about it. And now we were faced with this immediate problem, back again in 81. They stood right up there in the hill, in the halls of Congress, and stated that we were telling a falsehood that it could not get by July of 83 uh, without going broke. They said that wasn't true. So when we finally had to give up on that and saw what they were going to do, and they had been, they'd made it successfully, a political football. And because publications that I thought should have been defending me, like Human Events and all, uh, didn't. What, which well, you may on that one. Oh, maybe on that absolutely. But, we absolutely but let me say this, though. We to show you how successful they've been, 45% of the people yeah. in the polls actually state an answer to a direct question, yes, Ronald Reagan has cut my Social Security benefits. Now, there's been no cut, no reduction in COLA, nothing of that kind until now. Yeah. But this is how well they were able to fool them. All right. I said, and all during the campaign, I said that I believe that we should put together a, com a commission to study Social Security and see how it could be reformed for the long haul. So when they did this, and there was no way of curing them. Of, when I tried, went up on the hill and tried to talk to the leadership on the other side about it, could we not get together on this problem? Yeah. 
They refused. They said, we will not discuss Social Security with you. They knew they had a sure. pretty good football. Sure. Now, I went back to the commission idea. We appointed the commission. And it was bipartisan, and so you had both viewpoints in there. One side wanted nothing but raising taxes. The other side wanted the other approach. We came up with a compromise that I don't think is as bad as they say, and I'm going to explain it in a moment. Okay. But this compromise uh, completes about 70% of the overall plan. Uh, the long term? The long term. Yeah. Leaves about 30% to be solved. Now, I'm very happy about that. Yeah. Because this gives us a chance, now that it is taken out of politics, yeah. this gives us a chance to come again on the long-range plan and then try for the structural reforms that we think should be made, applying to the younger people in the workforce now, not the people presently getting their benefits beyond this COLA thing. But let's take the things they say are taxes. First of all, the biggest amount of the taxes aren't ours. These taxes were put in place all the way to 1990 in the 1977 legislation. No question. Every year, they raise the percentage of income that will be taxed, and there are about three more actual increases in rates. Now, we agreed, in return for getting the COLA thing, we agreed to move that bracket of taxes just up one year, but to protect the worker who will now find his Social Security taxes that were going to be raised anyway, to find them raised a year earlier, we give him a tax credit on his income tax equal to the amount. One year, though, isn't it only for one yeah. year? Yeah, but I think that that makes the bridge and compensates for it starting a year earlier. Uh, if you did it all the way out, then you'd be reducing the, the tax. Okay. Now, that's one. The second tax is, we're going to ask the people who have single individuals with an income of 20000 20000 not counting their Social Security, to now pay income tax on the Social Security part of their income. If a couple, $25,000 of earnings. This, in my view, is one of the structural steps to actually help take us back to where we should have been from the very beginning. The man who's over 90 years old today who created Social Security is in a nursing home, had a full-page article in the Washington Post about the mistakes yeah. they had made. And one of the mistakes was no means test. In other words, to keep everybody feeling proud and, or not embarrassed, they said, no, so Social Security's got to go to the millionaires, well, so everybody's equal, they're all yeah. getting it. Well, this is ridiculous. And people that are otherwise able to provide for themselves have no reason to be collecting it. It doesn't make any sense that I am now eligible for Social Security. I'm not going to take it, but I'm eligible. <laughs> now, so this, I think, taxing the Social Security part of these people with that kind of earnings end up yeah. is, is a very good thing to do. The third tax is the one of the self-employed. Now, right now, he pays 75% of the total paid by employer and employee in Social Security tax. Now, the self-employed is really employer and employee. So what we've done with him is say, he's now going to pay the same total of employer and employee, but just as business can take the Social Security tax that they pay as a tax deduction, a business expense, he will now be able to take that half of his Social Security payment as a tax deduction against his income tax. Now, we don't think that that makes very much of a change to him in what he was paying, and maybe in many instances it might, uh, it might make it that, that uh, he's, he's paying less because now, like the employer, he's getting to deduct well, that. I have seen different figures on extent. But do you think you're holding Social Security in check? Or don't you believe, I think that you've hinted that you might, uh, believe that we need, you know, certain structural reform. I, I, let me just say this. In other words, I think a lot of people will have this feeling that if Ronald Reagan got onto television and really explained what would happen to the average worker as he's getting taxed through the Social Security system, and if he saw you on television explain what was happening and why we needed these structural reforms, that even this short-term solution uh, could have been modified just tremendously. 
and people would have really seen. And they, in other words, you are out operating in the back of me. Uh, Claude Pepper and uh, Mr. Manat and everything can say anything they want to about Ronald Reagan and what he's trying to do, unless Ronald Reagan goes out on t television and actually says what the problem is, because the papers aren't going to carry it. And, yeah. and the media, and you are the one yeah. who has command over that media. I think the timing is a little wrong with this right where it is now. Remember this, we didn't just, they didn't just present a plan and we gave in. We had as many people on that commission and, and uh, fighting back on that. And it really got down to where it was either going to come apart and there was going to be nothing, or there was going to be a compromise. And this represents a compromise that when both sides said, okay, we can buy this, this to me was such progress and finally getting the issue out of politics. Because once this is passed, as I say, now you can go back and no one can throw a rock at the other side and say, well, or they can't throw rocks at us and say, well, you're trying to destroy uh, Social Security. Uh, now we can go back because we still have to resolve that 30%. That but you but are going to come back and resolve But we bought that. time. We bought enough time that maybe we can wait till uh, <laughs> uh, Things are a little better our way. Okay. Okay. Let me ask you another. Okay, about the, about um, how also do you expect conservatives to believe that you can t contain federal spending when you put in charge of the Health and Human Services Department? And we call that the Pac-Man of the federal budget. Uh, Mrs. Heckler, who over her years in Congress repeatedly fought to liberalize all the many programs that this department runs. Well, first of all, I have her pledge almost in, in blood on my forehead, that she will support my policies and what it is that this administration wants to do with those programs. Now, would you sure, I can you turn this off for a second? Because <laughs> I want to... There we go. Wait a second here. Something's wrong here. Okay. I, I think you'll see. I want, it, I want sure. this off the record. Margaret made a statement the other day that I think explains a lot of why she can do this. A congressperson represents a district and a constituency and has to be somewhat influenced by that constituency. Uh, they're there or here representing those people and their views. And she said this, but she said now as a member of the administration, she said my constituency is the whole United States and what must be done for the country as a whole. And so she said, I, I don't foresee any trouble at all. And as I say, she pledged completely her support of our administration okay. policies. All right. Many conservatives believe, whether fairly or not, that you are retreating somewhat rapidly at times from your initial goals. On the subject of taxes in particular, they point to the August tax hike, which the Tax Foundation referred to as the greatest tax in American history. I know you don't believe that, but that's what, that's what they said. The imposition of the highway taxes, your agreement to embrace new Social Security taxes, the newly proposed tax on health insurance benefits, the standby tax, etc. Uh, I was going to ask you, well, why do you think all these taxes are necessary? But there's a sort of a follow-up. And a former Assistant Secretary Treasurer of yours, Dr. Paul Craig Roberts, wrote in the January 14th Wall Street Journal, the way things are going, virtually all the tax breaks you furnished the American people in 1981 will be gone by 1987. And I disagree completely with it. Okay. Again, we've got to bring some, something up here in a kind of a historical pattern. We knew when we submitted our program that literally we were, uh, we were faced with a built-in tax increase over the next several years. Not only the Social Security tax, which, as I say, has already had a couple of increases since we've been here that was passed in 77. And then those, that whole string of taxes uh, increases, whether by actual increase or by increasing the amount of earnings that are taxed. We were aware of all that. But we were also aware that bracket creep was a built-in tax increase. Uh, you know, inflation, is deliberately brought about in many instances by government because it is a tax increase. People move up into, they get a cost of living pay raise. They're no better off than they were before, but then they're moved into another tax bracket in our progressive tax system, and they're worse off than they were before. 
And this was happening. Real earnings of the American people were going down steadily before we got here. Now, we didn't get all the tax cuts that we wanted, but we did get, in a sense, more than we wanted. They postponed and cut in half our first installment of the <coughs> income tax. They changed some other things. But once the bill was up there before Congress, it became a Christmas tree. And then everybody, including our opponents, started hanging their own goodies on that tree. And what we got back was a tax package bigger than we'd intended. I had said in the economic plan that we wanted to get taxing as a portion of the federal government down to about 20.6% of gross national product. We went way below that. At the time that we passed it, we were talking then of a second tax program. Not only were there other things we wanted to do, like tuition tax credits and so forth, that would be tax cuts in the future when we got by with this first one and when we could do the other. But we were also talking about closing off some, what we call, I don't like to use the word loophole because they've used the word loophole to describe some pretty legitimate tax deductions, but unintended benefits. Tax legislation that was passed with regard to a certain industry and suddenly the industry found it and created a benefit that was never intended and that they were getting millions and millions of dollars each year in, in tax benefits from this. We said we wanted to look at that. We wanted to look at strict reinforcement ability to collect tax that was, not, that was owed but not now being paid. That would come with the second package. When we found out that the Christmas tree thing had set us back, not only was our, our faster decline in, in inflation shutting off bracket creep so that revenue estimates were off, we were down below, but we just weren't collecting because of these things that had been hung on there. Now, in August, faced with this fact, some of the things we put in that tax bill were some of the Christmas tree ornaments that we got rid of. The other part of it, a third of it, a full third of that tax bill, is improved collection to collect money from people that are not now paying it but owe it. I think the average taxpayer that pays wants to know that there isn't some joker living across the street that's getting a free ride at his expense. So this was part of that bill, full third of it. Now, that covers that one and why I was willing to go forward. I said reluctantly, but I had to realize that I can't line item veto as I could when I was governor. So when that tax bill came back, I wanted the tax bill. I hadn't wanted as much as we got. Even, on, even the withholding on dividends and interest? For the reason for that being in there, and incidentally, mm -hmm. everyone's forgotten how many people aren't covered by that. The people up to a certain level, they don't have to pay, they're, they're not going to be withheld. It's only at, a, at an upper level. But that was in there because we found out that was one of the biggest sources of evasion that one of the biggest sources of people getting by without paying the tax is in that. And there's just no way that the Treasury Department, the IRS, without building it up as big as the Army, can catch that and intercept it. And this was the practical way to get the people that are not now paying on that. There are, there are disputes, I mean, as, as to whether that many people are evading. Well, this the, chamber, the Chamber of Commerce people would Well, I had, to go, I had to go by what but the I'm Treasury not, Department sure. says in their sure. records. Now, we come to the gasoline tax. Yes, I stood before a press conference about a year before and said, when someone asked about a gas tax, and I said the only way they'd get it would be by a way of a palace coup. That time, they were talking about the gas tax as just another way of increasing general revenues. Well, I'd spent eight years in California fighting liberal Democrats who wanted to open the gas tax of California to, general re to become general revenue. They want to get their hands on it. In California, it is a user's fee. The gas tax pays everything. The highway patrol, the maintenance, even provides money to local and, and county governments for, the, for help on their roads and so forth. We come here, and over a year ago, Drew Lewis came to me with a horrendous report on our highway system, the federal highway system, as well as uh, primary highways, the states and the bridges 
And it was a frightening report. We, companies that have to do a lot of shipping, that lose millions of dollars a year by having to reroute their trucks to avoid stretches of highway or bridges that they do not believe their trucks can go over anymore. And I asked him then when he did that, bad as it was, I said, this was the first year when we were talking all our tax bills and everything, I said, Drew, can you come back next year with that and we'll see what we can do. But right now, we just can't. Mm -hmm. He came back a year later uh, on the dot and reminded me, and now the report was worse. Bridges all over the country where school buses stop and unload the kids and make them walk across a bridge and then the driver, uh, with his fingers crossed, drives the empty bus across. Yeah. They don't want the tragedy of then they think the bridge is that dangerous. And so it was presented as a user fee to be used for that. It was only coincidental, really, that a sideline benefit might be um, the... Uh, um, uh, sideline benefit minutes. would be the... Uh, How much minutes? You've been here 40 minutes. Uh, okay. Jobs. Yeah. Uh, but we would have done it anyway for that fact. But it is, in my view, this is, this is purely for that, and this is temporary once this job is done. So this is what made the difference on that. But now, final figure, and then I, I know okay. I'm filibustering here. No. The final figure will be this. Even if the contingency tax plan, which the only reason I bought that was because that one says to the Congress, it's only a contingency plan if you cut the spending, as we ask. Mm -hmm. And a couple of other provisions in there, too. If the recession is on full recovery, uh, we don't have it, no. But even if that is passed, over these years, out to 1988, we, the taxpayer in the United States, will have $735 billion more in their pockets than they would have had not been for our tax plan. Okay, so you're disputing, obviously, Mr. Uh, Toure, Mr. Ray Roberts, and, and even, I don't well, know, the Washington Post had a thing. So well, like 42, but maybe they're not figuring it the right way. Okay. Re read the way I'm saying it. Okay. The built-in tax increases yeah. that we inherited are there. Yeah. And you know there's no way you're going to get rid of those. Yeah. They're there, and they would be reducing the amount of money yeah. in the people's Right. Our tax cuts have seen that not only will they not be reduced, they will have, no, they will have $735 billion more than they would have had with those tax increases and without our tax cuts. Okay. So I think we're ahead of them, ahead of the game, but we weren't responsible for those. But it's still going to be in terms of tax take as a percent of gross national product. It's still supposedly going up yes, to 22 remember, or 23 Yes, but remember, we did go down below where we were supposed right. to be. Right. And we're now, we think that all of this would bring us back to about what, what where levels? we originally, about 20.6, where we... About 1980 levels or something? Uh, like that. Uh, back to where you, back to your Chicago my, plan. My Chicago plan, 20.6%. Yeah. In terms of years, though, I just want to know what year would it be back at? You this year with the standby tax enacted. I understand that, but what, in other words, the level of taxation well, of 1980 or 79? Well, taking the the, um, the five-year projection, yeah, that would be to 19. The uh, you you have to project five years. Right. Uh, would it bring it back so to over the next five years? Yeah. I just want to know what year yeah. it would bring it back to uh, approximately oh. as a percent. But um, also so remember that this includes. Uh, I will not give in on the indexing or the third okay. phase of I'm that gonna, tax. I want to ask you that. You said you will not give in. Will you veto? Will you flatly veto a plan if they if the Congress? decides to uh, pass something which would uh, get rid of the third year or and or the uh, well, I have, indexation. I have always been reluctant me, to say it without, uh, what I will veto or what I won't, because sometimes an orange turns into an apple on its way to your desk. Okay. Uh, go ahead. Uh, he's got the other. Won't be. Go ahead. Oh. Oh, it doesn't seem to work now. For me to understand. It's complicated here. Yeah, that's what it's going to do. It's work. Okay. I guess it's going on. Right. Okay. Just to, so let me just put it this way I will fight to the death 
from my own uh, okay. with regard to those two. Okay. Now, you were going to ask about indexing. Let me just add something about indexing that I think belongs in this, this story. We're reducing inflation at such a rate that, that indexing cannot mean an awful lot to the average taxpayer because cost of living pay raises would be so low. But I want indexing, even if we've if we totally eliminated inflation, I want indexing for the future to permanently take away from government the inducement to create inflation in order to get a tax increase without passing one. Okay. Well, I think our readers will like that. Uh, let me ask you, now this is, I know, it's a ticklish question, but as you are undoubtedly aware that many conservatives are unhappy with your chief of staff, Jim Baker. For the most part, they like him personally, they acknowledge his efficiency and competency, and they believe that he is loyal to you in his, uh, in his lights. But they also believe his views are not necessarily compatible with your own. As evidence, they cited a January 9, 1983 Dallas Morning News interview in which Mr. Baker took some sharp jabs at an awful lot of uh, people, all of which happened to be conservatives who are working for you or who have worked for you. Beyond that, the article suggested his views were not the article suggested that his views were not very much in accord with yours. And he was quoted as saying, and I quote, I am I'm considerably more moderate than Reagan is, period, unquote. Not more moderate, just considerably more moderate. The question is, don't you believe it is extremely difficult for Mr. Baker to implement your views since he seems to be at odds with you philosophically? Well, first of all, there isn't any way he could not <laughs> implement them. When I've made a decision and I make the decisions, uh, uh, Jim came in here and he was, I know how he felt about that interview. A couple of fellows sitting in a turkey blind out there talking and incidentally, the tape recorder was going on. but incidentally he'd been told that that interview was to be on uh, one subject and one subject alone, yeah. and uh, uh, which was turkey shooting. <laughs> okay. So he sat there with a fellow that he knew and I think it was a little bit like uh, Dave Stockman's being victimized uh, earlier in the administration. But anyway, I, I know how he felt about them. I have never seen uh, uh, any instance of Jim. Uh, he's presented all views as everyone else does. When we sit in there in that cabinet room, we, uh, you know, this is, that's what I brought about was cabinet government. I want a cabinet that Everybody gets into this, and I hear all sides of every issue, and then, then I make the decision. I don't take a vote. Yeah. I make the decision based on what I've heard and, uh, and what I think. And I think that, that uh, Jim feels that sometimes uh, maybe there is a, another view that should be presented or a more moderate view sometimes, at least so that I have it. But I've never seen him once question or rebel when I've made the decision. You, don't, you, you do not believe, that, as a lot of people do, that there is an effort by Mr. Baker and others to go with some of the senators and try to uh, work very hard on you to sort of change your view. No, I don't think that happens. You don't no. think that happens? Okay. Because I, uh, uh, first of all, I know some of those senators and uh, uh, I know their, uh, some of their loyalty to me, they wouldn't hold still for it for a minute. Is Jim Watt going to resign? I mean, you see, we read that now. Uh, I hope not. Uh, here's a man who's gotten probably the worst case uh, of being painted uh, into a corner that anyone in this administration, if anyone will look at the record of the Department of Interior and what they have done with regard to the national park system, what they've done with regard to wilderness lands, all of these things, they will find the Department of Interior has never run more efficiently and done more what the people want. Now, I'll give you one example in figures. This 800,000 acres of supposed, proposed wilderness land that he sent a recommendation to the Congress that had not be included. Everyone has immediately portrayed this. The general public believes that he has taken 800,000 acres of wilderness land and freed it being wilderness land. We've got 80 million acres of wilderness land. Under the Carter administration, they proposed that a hundred eighty million. Yeah, they proposed that hundred and seventy-four million acres be looked at to see if it any of it should be added to the wilderness that we now have. While that administration was still here, they wrote off hundred and fifty-five 
million of those 174 acres uh, that it should not. And what we got down to was about, well, about 150 million, I should say, because it left about 24 million acres that was still under study. This was land. Now, the law spe specifies why it can be ruled out. If it's got roads built on it, it can't be wilderness land. If it is in dual ownership, if there's someone owns the mineral rights, if some other uh, element of government is in partial ownership with the federal government, it cannot be considered. So, he comes in the continuing study, after the previous administration's already ruled out 150 million of those 174 million acres, 24 million acres. He takes less than a million acres. 800,000 and says, well, here, the continued study reveals that these are like the 150, they got roads on them, or they or dual ownership and so forth, and says they should be crossed off. And the feathers hit the fan. He's still studying the remainder of this, or the, the whole land study is going on. But this is the type of thing that's been happening to him all the way in here. And I have to tell you, he has been as big a friend of the outdoors as any environmentalist would want. And uh, they just... Can you give an example here, since I think you would like that? Well, the national parks had deteriorated terribly. And he came in and found that under the previous administration, maintenance money was being cut down like that for the maintenance of the parks or the rehabilitation of them. And yet they were putting up additional money to buy more parkland. He said, we're not going to buy more parkland until we use some money to refurbish the parks that we've got. And this is what he has done. His spending on reinstituting these parks and putting them back to the shape they should be in is far greater than the previous administration's spending ever was. Right. Well, one question on Taiwan, because I know you know that's one of our concerns. But in the U.S., uh, during your 19 begin to upgrade their military in a way that it becomes a de facto threat to Taiwan, even though the mainland issues no menacing statements at all, would you and or your successor feel obligated to upgrade the military on Taiwan? Well, I think all of this is covered in the Taiwan Relations Act. When I said those things in the, in the campaign, I knew that the act was there, but the act was not being lived up to. In other words, things were still being done that were humiliating, Taiwanese and the, 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 uh, contrary to what they had called for. Now, our communique is a very carefully worked out deal, and we did not give an inch. In that communique, the People's Republic has agreed that they are going to try and peacefully resolve the Taiwanese issue between the two of them as being an internal affair. We, in turn, linked our statement about weaponry to that and said, in other words, the understanding of this is that if they make progress and do indeed peacefully work out a solution agreeable to both sides, obviously there would no longer be any need for arms. And this is all a reference to reducing arms is tied to progress in that. As long as there is no progress made, we will abide by the Taiwan uh, Relations Act, which says that we will help maintain Taiwan's defensive posture and capability. Well, what if there is, let's say, progress of the sort, or mild progress in the sort, but the point is that Taiwan, but that the mainland feels for, because they say they're sovereign and all the rest, but that it must still increase its military arsenal. In other words, it must, uh, it must modernize. Then, it just seems to me, what happens then at that point to Taiwan? Do we still go along with the idea that their military cannot be upgraded? Uh, no, we're, no, we're doing all the things that we had always done. The shipments are regularly but going not forward. A, but nothing is in advance of what they already have. Uh, in other words, there's an F-5E, but there's nothing beyond an F-5E. There's, not an F, there's, there's no F-16 well, or, or F uh, whatever they have. Only on the got. basis that it was, and it was ruled and they were agreeable that it was not necessary. They're, they're satisfied with what they're getting. Right now they're getting F-104s. Yeah. Um, but it's not considered as good as the other. And I mean, on the other, we are making progress in that other. We Now their people meet our people in, in offices and so forth. But on the, at the same time, I want to say this. We want to go forward. I think it would be foolish of us not to go forward with trying to keep good relations of, 
with the People's Republic of China, improve those relations. The very fact that uh, under three previous presidents, and the one including the one who opened up the relations in the first place, there was and still remains a solid reason for doing that. But not at the expense of Taiwan. And we will carry out the terms of the Taiwan Relations Act. If the day ever comes that those two find that they can get together and uh, be one China uh, peacefully, then as I say, there wouldn't be any need and that's all it was meant in the communique. Nothing was meant beyond that. We're not going to say, well, just because time goes by, we're going to reduce uh, the arms to them. I'm not saying we're going to reduce, we're just not going to upgrade. That's the, that's the key phrase, is the upgrading of it. In other words, that when I was there and talked to those people and their, and their leaders, their point was that we couldn't give them advanced bombers or advanced uh, fighter planes, rather. And, uh, and we can't even give them certain defensive weapons because these defensive weapons hadn't gone to them prior to this uh, communique. So they said no, they can't. I don't, they can't think, so. I don't think we're bound. I think we're giving them what uh, what okay. we mutually agree on when their people come here and sit down and go over this. What we mutually agree is necessary to their defense. Okay, so excuse me. And I will see that that continues. Okay, sir. So. All right. Thank you very much, Mr. Brother, for giving me some of your time. Okay. I got to run for the day. Okay. okay. Thank you. Yes, you, you didn't ask about it. I was just going to show you. There's a list we're, of some okay. conservative people that we have just the last. Handful of uh, I know. appointees. Well, that's all right. Okay. Yeah. We've